Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, program number four. For those of you joining us on television, now I, I guess I've rehearsed it often enough over the years that we tape four programs in a row. And uh, for those of you who have just joined us recently then, don't wonder why everybody's sitting in the same place. They do not have assigned seats. And I guess I'll have to address the question, why don't we have any young people? Well, we've got one today, and uh, it's uh, summertime, and it's a little more out. But ordinarily, see, when we tape on a Wednesday afternoon, the working age people are working. And uh, it's our retired people that we have to depend on. But uh, we always write and tell people, rest assured, we've got a lot of young people in our audience and uh, when we go to seminars, we have a fair amount of them. So anyway, we're always glad for these that do come in because I couldn't do this without our studio audience and uh, to have friendly and uh, agreeable faces in front really helps because I don't know what I'd do if uh, everybody was constantly arguing or something. But anyway, uh, we want to remind our listening audience that we are now in book 56 and uh, these are the first four programs and then the next eight will finish 56. Okay, now let's go back and um, I'm going to spend a little more time on that verse that we ended up with in the last half hour. First John chapter 1 verse 9. And as I said in the last program, for years and years I, and I imagine most of Christendom still do, we use this as a verse for believers who sin. But when you really analyze it, this is a salvation verse for the kingdom believers to whom John is writing. Now never lose sight of that fact, as we've been repeating and repeating and repeating, that James and Peter and John are all writing to Jews. Now a verse just comes to mind. I guess we better use it. Galatians, honey. Let's go back to Galatians because I know this flies in the face of a lot of Christendom. They say, well, where do you get that this is all to the Jew? Well, I'm going to base it on the character of these men. Galatians chapter 2. And uh, this is the Jerusalem Council. And for those of you who may not be aware, but see the Jerusalem Council was held about 51 A.D., <clears throat> which is about uh, 21, 22 years after Pentecost or after the cross. And the problem that has arisen is that the Jewish kingdom believers were still trying to convince Paul's Gentile believers under his gospel of grace that they had to practice circumcision and keeping the law and the commandments. And of course, finally, it came to a point of such controversy that the Lord, of course, was in part of it, that Paul and Barnabas should go up to Jerusalem and deal with this problem with the Twelve and the Jerusalem leadership. And you all know that if you've heard me teach very long, that at this Jerusalem council then, it was finally agreed that Paul and Barnabas would be the apostles of the Gentiles and that the disciples would confine their ministry to Israel. Well now here's the verse, and I can't go down through all of these, but I'll just come down after that, I think it was a long day of disputations. And finally Paul was able to get through to these men that he was not on the same page as they were. They were the apostles of Israel, and he was the apostle for the Gentile, and the twain can never be brought together. All right, now if you'll come back with me there then to Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. Galatians 2, verse 7. Now, don't lose sight of the setting. Paul has now been out amongst the Gentiles establishing these little congregations of Gentiles on his gospel, the gospel of grace, the preaching of the cross, but these Jews out of the kingdom economy in Jerusalem are still under the law. The temple is still operating. Now don't forget the temple hasn't been destroyed yet. 
And so these Jews are still practicing temple worship. And Paul, of course, has now gotten his Gentile believers separated from all that. And so here's the agreement. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, Paul writes, when they, the twelve, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that's Gentiles, was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision, Israel, was committed unto Peter. Now that's plain language. Two totally different concepts. The gospel of the Gentile had been committed unto the Apostle Paul. The gospel for the Jews had been committed to Peter and the eleven. All right, now then verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of Israel, the circumcision, the same, that is the same Christ, the same God, was mighty in me toward what people? The Gentile. Now that's as different as daylight and dark. There's no amalgamating them. Peter, the apostle of Israel. Paul's the apostle of Gentile. All right, now read on. Verse 9. And when James and Peter and John, the same three writers that we're studying at the end of our New Testament, in that order, not Peter, James, and John, it's James and Peter and John. All right. So when James and Peter and John, who seem to be pillars, that is, of the kingdom economy up there at Jerusalem, perceived or understood the grace that was given unto me, when they understood, yes, Paul is the apostle of Gentiles. We're the apostles of Israel. All right? When they perceived that, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. All three of them did. The word hands is plural. And they gave unto me the right hands of fellowship. And here was the gentleman's agreement. And that's what I always call this. This was a gentleman's agreement. No more subterfuge. No more undermining Paul's ministry. We're going to leave you to the Gentiles. And now look what it is. They agreed with the right hands of fellowship that we, Paul and Barnabas, should go to the heathen, the Gentiles, and they, James and Peter and John and the rest of the Jerusalem leadership, the kingdom economy, they would stay where? With the circumcision, with Israel. Now I'm going to take a minute let that soak in. In 51 A.D., this was the gentleman's agreement that Paul would be the apostle of the Gentiles, with Barnabas' help, of course, and that the twelve would confine their ministry to Israel. Now, had the Holy Spirit inspired James and Peter and John back here in our New Testament to start mingling their message to the Gentiles, what would that have done to the agreement in Jerusalem? It would have blown it out of the water. Somebody would have been less than honest. But it was an honest agreement, and they all held to it. Now, I can show you early in Acts. Come back to Acts chapter 8. All the way back to Acts chapter 8. Because I know this doesn't go down easy for a lot of people. Because tradition is a tough thing to overcome. But Acts chapter 8, and this is about seven years after Pentecost, and they have just stoned Stephen. And Saul of Tarsus is heading up the persecution. And it's intense. And the Jerusalem church is under such pressure that they're starting to scatter like a flock of quail. All right, verse 8, I mean chapter 8, verse 1. So Saul, the persecutor, that orthodox Jew, Pharisee of the Pharisees, was consenting to his, Stephen's death. 
And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, the Jewish kingdom church in Jerusalem. And they, these Jewish kingdom believers, the ones that James and Peter and John are addressing in their little epistles, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. What are the last three words? Except the apostles. Why? Well, they weren't about to leave their home base. They weren't about to leave Jerusalem. Because after all, once Israel should repent and come to a knowledge of Jesus as their Messiah, to what place on the globe would the Messiah return? Jerusalem. He's going to come to the Mount of Olives when he returned. And they weren't about to leave because they still had high hopes that somehow or other, in spite of all this persecution, that the Jews would be able to convert the whole nation and that the Messiah could yet come. That's their whole premise. But you have to understand that when these three men are writing these epistles at the end of our New Testament, they were under that agreement of Galatians chapter 2, and they could not have gone against that. It wouldn't have been gentlemanly. It wouldn't have been Christian. And so I maintain they did not. And they kept their ministry on the kingdom ground to Israel, and they're letting Paul uh, fulfill his ministry then among the Gentiles. All right, now let's come back and pick up some of Paul's statements to show that he was totally removed from anything concerning the kingdom economy and uh, the twelve in Jerusalem. Let's see, are we still in Galatians 2? Are you still Galatians 2? You were? That was the last one? Okay, let's stay back there and, and go to Galatians 1 for just a moment. Galatians 1. Galatians 1, verse 11. Now remember, Paul is writing to Gentiles. And he's writing to Gentiles who were succumbing to the false teaching of these Jerusalem people that they had to keep the law. And so the whole book of Galatians is written on that basis. You're not under the law. You don't have to keep kosher food. You don't have to keep the commandments as such. And you don't have to do all the things that the law required because you're under grace. See? All right, verse 11. Galatians 1, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Why? Because I did not receive it of man, neither was I taught it by other men, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what's he telling us? And I always put it this way, under normal circumstances, here someone comes to a knowledge of who Jesus was, like Saul of Tarsus, years after the fact, wouldn't it have been normal for him to go right back to Jerusalem, find Peter, James, and John, and say, well now look, I now recognize that I was wrong. I now know that the Jesus that you preach was the Messiah. Tell me everything you know. Wouldn't that have been logical? Of course it would have. Because old Saul knew that these men had been with Jesus for three years. He knew they had been preaching the Messiahship and the kingship of Christ for these intervening six, seven years. It would have been the logical place to go. But the Spirit forbade him. The Spirit, instead of letting him go southwest to Jerusalem, and I've done this even on the board, on the program, he sends him southeast into Arabia. Opposite direction, basically. Why? He didn't want Paul's teaching to be muddled with anything that the Twelve had to offer. He had to have a total revelation of things completely different. All based on the same Christ, of course, the same God. But it's going to be a whole new revelation. All right, 
So what's that revelation? Now come back with me to Romans chapter 16, verse 25. You know, and I've, I've asked my seminars around the country, have you ever heard a Sunday morning sermon with a text, Romans 16, verse 25? Well, finally, last fall, up at uh, our Concordia seminar in Minneapolis, we had two or three hands. That's the first time. I've never had anybody admit that they had a Sunday morning sermon with the text, Romans 16, verse 25. Why they avoid it like a plague. And look what it says. Now to him, the Christ, that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now remember what's Paul's gospel? That Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Now to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. A revealing of something that's never been mooted before. Something totally different. And what is it? This mystery that was kept secret since the ages began. Now what was kept secret? That when Jesus of Nazareth was rejected as the Messiah of Israel, God in his eternal purposes brought about the work of the cross. And the work of the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his shedding blood, was now going to open up salvation not just to Israel, not just to the white race, not just to the third world, but to who? The whole world. Now turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. See, now this, this is just a whole different concept than what Peter, James, and John understood. They were preaching to Israel on the basis of the Old Testament covenant promises. They had no concept that God was now going to save the whole human race. They were stuck with the idea of Israel. But now look what Paul writes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Dropping down to verse 14. Oh, I know it takes a little bit to see it, but once people see it, oh, it is so plain, it just opens this book up like a 300-watt bulb. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ. See, now sometimes people will write and say, Lest you make too much of Paul. No, I don't make too much of Paul. Paul is merely the one who points us to the Christ. And that's what he's always saying. He preaches Christ crucified. Not Paul. But Paul is that eminent apostle of the Gentiles to whom was revealed this tremendous gospel of grace. Beyond human understanding, we just simply take it by faith, see? All right, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. The love of Christ constraineth us, drives us, because we thus judge or conclude. Now watch this. If one died for all, then were all dead. Now you know there is teaching about that the limited atonement that Christ only died for the believer. Don't you believe it? He died for all. He died for the whole human race. All right? And if he did die for all, then it's a natural conclusion then that all were what? Dead, spiritually. Like we saw in the last program. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now verse 15. And that he died for all that they who live spiritually and get eternal life, that they who live should not henceforth, from the time of their salvation, when they've been justified and they've been granted eternal life, that from that point on they do not live to themselves, 
but put the verb back in, but they live unto him who died for them, and what? Rose again. See that? Paul never shuns the resurrection. It's everywhere. But you see, the Jewish writers don't mention it because that wasn't part and parcel of the kingdom gospel. The kingdom gospel was to believe who Jesus was. The grace gospel is to believe that not only did Christ die for our sins, but he rose from the dead. All right, now read on. Wherefore, because of the death, burial, and resurrection, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, in other words, according to his earthly ministry and before he was crucified, Yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. And you know what Paul is saying? He lived contemporary with Christ. He was already that fanatical Jew and was probably just burning at the fringes when he saw the crowds following this Jesus of Nazareth. He knew his ministry. He knew what he was doing. He knew with those three years of Christ in the flesh. But... It was the crucified, buried, and risen, and ascended Lord that confronted Saul on the road to Damascus, not Jesus of Nazareth in those three years. See the difference? Oh, what a difference. Jesus chose the twelve in his ministry of the flesh inside the borders of Israel. This man he confronted after his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension outside the borders of Israel, on Gentile ground. And that just separates them, see? And that's why they had to come to the conclusion. Yes, they would maintain their ministry with Israel up until it finally all fell apart, but this man would go to the Gentile. And now even archaeology supports by the end of the first century that element of Jewish believers, or what I call the kingdom believers, disappeared. They just disappeared. You don't see any evidence of them anymore in archaeology or history anywhere else. But for those 70 years from the time of the cross until about the end of the century, there were these little Jewish congregations scattered throughout the Roman Empire. But they never entered into this gospel of grace. All right, now then, i got to take one more verse here in 2 Corinthians 5 before we go on. Verse 17, and oh, what a verse. Therefore, therefore, what's that therefore? Because of the death, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. See, now that's another terminology that is uniquely Paul. The Jewish kingdom believer had no concept of being in Christ. That's the body element. And it is a grace age doctrine that the moment we become a believer, we are placed into the body of Christ. We're in Christ. I had a gentleman, I think, out in Indiana. He said, Les, I hear all the time about being in Christ, but nobody ever tells anybody how to get there. <laughs> and I said, you know, you're right. How do we get in Christ? By believing the gospel. Because as soon as we become a believer of the gospel, the Holy Spirit places us into the body of Christ. And we become members one of another. As fingers and toes and eyes and ears are members of this body, every believer is a member of the body of Christ. That's a Pauline concept. It was never revealed before. And this is all part of the revelation of the mysteries, that if we're in Christ, now then read on in verse 17, we are a new what? Creation. We're a whole new creation. God has worked a work within us that makes us different. All right? And so we're a new creation. Consequently, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself and then has passed on to us the ministry of reconciliation to tell others to be reconciled. 
Oh, this is all Pauline truth. See, and you don't pick this up in the kingdom economy. Well, let's see. Where else can I go? Ephesians. Ephesians. You only got a couple minutes left. We might as well just stay here with Paul. Ephesians. Chapter 1. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Now there's another point I like to make. Rarely does Paul use the term Jesus alone. One or two places he does, but as a rule, he puts the full title, and I think it's appropriate even for us. We refer to him as our Lord Jesus the Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings, not here on earth, not name it and claim it, but where? In the heavenlies. That's where our riches are. Our riches are in the heavenlies. We may go through this life poor as paupers. Most Christians down through the centuries have. It's only been in the last few years where Christians have enjoyed the wealth. For most of church history, they were the poverty-stricken element. And that's, of course, as Paul teaches. We are not promised earthly blessings because we're a believer. Ours are heavenly. Ours are waiting for us. We're laying them up in glory, see? All right, so he's already blessed us in the heavenlies in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. In other words, before anything was ever created, God already knew we'd be believers today. And that we should be holy or set apart and without blame before him in love. And then he predestinated us to our position in Christ. But all, oh, now let's now got to quickly down to verse 13, and then we'll quit. Ephesians 1, verse 13, In whom, he says, you also trusted, believed, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you repented and were baptized. No, that's not what it says. After you what? Believed. See, that's the whole crux of Paul's message, is that we believe that everything that needed to be done was done in that work of the cross. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.